What the heck is a polar covalent bond? So let's first answer this question. What's a co what's a covalent bond again? Covalent bond. Sharing of how many? One covalent bond. A covalent bond is sharing of two. So a covalent bond is sharing of two electrons. Okay, sharing of two electrons. Now, what's a polar covalent bond? Well, all sharing isn't necessarily equal. So there, I've got hydrogen chloride, which is a nice example of a polar covalent compound. You've got two electrons that have been shared by the hydrogen and the chlorine. One of those electrons comes from the hydrogen, the other one comes from the chlorine. Up until now, we just said they were shared. But what we didn't tell you is that those electrons are not always shared equally. All right? You can see in this diagram, I've drawn those electrons closer to the chlorine than to the hydrogen. Why would that be? Electronegativity of the chlorine is higher. Why would that be? That's true. Protons. Okay. So chlorine has got 17 protons. Hydrogen's only got one. Now you're competing for an electron pair. 17 versus one is not a fair fight. So the chlorine dominates those electrons. So that's why I've drawn them purposely closer to the chlorine, which means the hydrogen hardly ever gets to see his electrons. Okay. It's like one of these, you know, families where the kids go and live with the with the mom or whatever, and dad hardly ever gets to see them. So it's not quite that because these two are still in a relationship, but it's not a fair relationship. Okay, I'll tell you now. So, because the hydrogen's electrons spend most of the time by the chlorine, the hydrogen's positive charge is not fully cancelled out. So, we say the hydrogen is a little bit positive. That funny letter there is the Greek D for delta, but it's a small d, and it means small amount or small change. All right, so it's a little bit positive, and then what we do is we say the chlorine side is a little bit negative. It's not a full negative charge, it's just a partially negative. So this molecule is a little bit positive and a little bit negative. Now, how do we know that this happened? How do we know that this happened? Let's see if I can get my party to work. I might have to borrow you. I know. Oh. So what? Uh, what the heck? It's because you, you need to flip the ruler, so not the. Look at this. Fiction. Static electricity. Static electricity can attract the water molecule. Why? Because the water molecules are also polar. You'll see, I'll show you in a minute. They've got a Every single water molecule has a charge on it. And you can attract it with a charged object. Okay? So, are you ever looking for a party trick? I just gave you one. Now, HCL is another example. <laughs> yeah, rub it on your head. Just find a ruler, you know. Carry on with you. Um, so here we've got a polar molecule. So this is now a polar covalent bond, right? So there we go, polar covalent bond. Each side of the molecule has a small charge due to the electrons being unequally shared. So they use this term, they call it a dipole moment. Now, I know that name used to frustrate me. It might frustrate you as well, hopefully not. What does it mean? It means the electrons are pulled across that way. So you see this arrow, this red thing here that I've drawn with a sort of a cross on this side and an arrow that side. It's showing you which way the electrons have been attracted. It's a dipole moment, and they turn out to be quite useful. You'll see why in a minute. Now, if a molecule has got an overall dipole moment, in other words, if there's a positive side and a negative side, then we say it's a polar molecule, all right? <clears throat> now, here is a little sum. What's the sum? Remember I said to you yesterday there's a electronegativity power of something to attract its electrons. This business. Now, remember, all of science comes down to numbers. So there's a guy who's worked, well, there's actually a few people that have worked out a number related to electronegativity. And the number is in this table here. 
okay? 2.1, 1 point naught. How did they work it out? I don't know. There's different scales. The scale we use is the called the Pauling or Pauling electronegativity scale. And I've put the numbers in that thing there just to show you which way they get bigger and which way they get smaller. I'll come to you in a second. You can see as you go down, they get smaller. And as you go from left to right, they get bigger. So electronegativity increases as you go up and it increases from left to right, which means that the biggest electronegativity is fluorine, four. On the pounding scale, you can't get a bigger electronegativity than fluorine. Um, Mo? I don't know. It's a good question. I actually don't know. Yeah. But all the trends in the periodic table come from the electronic structure, and the electronic structures determine the properties, and the structure of the periodic table came from the properties. So that's why it, it works. All right. So that's electronegativity. And now um, we got to here, and I said to you that this is... Here, we work out the difference in electronegativity. Now, where do you get these numbers from? You get the periodic table? See this number on the side? Until now, you've ignored it. That number is very important. That's the falling electronegativity of that element. So, what we do is this. To work out if this is a polar compound, you work out the difference in electronegativity between those two elements. Now we've got hydrogen and chlorine. So hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.1. Chlorine's electronegativity is 3.0. So you take the smallest one from the biggest one, 2.1 from 3 is 0 0.9. Now there's a scale, and I'll show you the scale, about if the electronegativity is bigger, difference in electronegativity is bigger than a certain amount, then we say it's polar. If the difference in electronegativity is smaller than a certain amount, we say it's not polar. That's a similar amount. Yeah, 0.9. <laughs> so I'll show you in a minute. There's a table that you have to learn. So chlorine has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen, um, and therefore it is a polar molecule. It's a polar bond, and it's a polar molecule. Now move off that slide. You're all happy with it. Understand all of it, yeah? So we talk about this thing now as a dipole. What's a dipole? It's got two poles, two oppositely charged poles, right? So, um, what I've drawn here, also you'll see in some textbooks and things, you'll see them refer to an electron density diagram. They'll draw something which represents where most of the electrons are. And in this case, most of the electrons will be around the chlorine because it pulls the electrons towards itself. Mo, another question? <laughs> No, two poles, two oppositely charged poles, positive and negative. Yes. So, substance bonds, like a substance that's bonded with two other um, of the same elements, could that still be a polar bond? Okay, so good question. If a substance bonds with two of the same elements, can it be polar? No, because their electronegativities are going to be the same. So, they're going to pull equally hard on the electrons, so the electrons will be in the middle. All right. So, the difference in electronegativity, they will be zero, and so it won't be polar. So, like, so, hydrogen sulfide. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you now. So, this is the table with the electronegativity in showing you where the electronegativity increases. So, you must know the trends in the electronegativity. We don't expect you to know these numbers. And obviously, we're going to give you the periodic table with them in anyway. Right? So, but what we do expect you to know is this, and you won't be given this. Now, let me tell you, this little table that you can see in front of you has caused more trouble in chemistry than anything else that I know. And the reason is that they often change these flippant boundaries. And there is not even agreement among all chemists about where these boundaries would be, should be. So I think what I've got here is the latest version of them, um, but it's, it's actually... It's actually quite complicated. So we'll work with the values that are in the notes. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about this. How do we know if a bond is polar or not? These are the numbers. Okay. Now, basically, if the difference in electronegativity is zero, then it's a non-polar substance. 
if the difference in electronegativity is bigger than zero, then it's obviously a polar bond. Now, I suspect that the next slide I've got here changes these values. No, it doesn't. Okay. So, if the difference in the electronegativity between the two elements in the bond is between naught and two, then we say it's a polar covalent bond. Okay. If the difference in electronegativity is bigger than two, then we'll say it's ionic. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because if it's a metal and a non-metal that are bonding, then we'll say it's ionic if the electronegativity difference is bigger than 1.7. Okay, so look, we're going to do lots of examples and hopefully it'll become more clear. But that's the basis of it. So in this, in this. Um, no, it's polar because it's but the difference in extra is 0 0.9 and it's between 0 and 2.0. Okay. Now, over here, I've written some stuff. You can ignore this here. But all I'm telling you is this the reason that this process or this this decision is not necessarily straightforward is because it's actually a lot more complicated than this. And Linus Pauling, the guy who cut and worked out this, the scale, basically says that when the separation on the scale is 1.9, the bond is about 50% ionic. So what are we saying? It's not actually true to say this thing is polar or it's non-polar. It's, it's actually on a scale. And it's got like some non-polar character and some polar character. And we basically decide whether it's polar or non-polar, depending on whether it's more than 50% polar or non-polar. Now, you don't have to worry about that. You just got to stick to the scale. But that's how we decide it. That's what's behind it. All right. Yes. So how do you decide if it's polar or not? It is like sort of like carbon tetrapolar. So we're, we're going to look at some examples. We're going to look at some examples. So what I did here is I put the, that same table. Um, so David, you are listening because you're sort of staring over that way. Okay. No, it's fine. As long as you are with me. Um, so those are the WCED boundaries. That's what you have to work with. Um, if it's between naught and two, then it's polar covalent. That's if it's a non-metal. But for metals and non-metals, if it's between naught and 1.7, then it's polar. And if it's bigger than 1.7, it will be ionic. All right. Uh, but for two non-metals, it has to be bigger difference than two to be ionic. So we'll do some examples. Let's have a look at, at water. This diagram over here with these contour lines, that is known as the electron density diagram. And it's showing you, you can see there's much more contour, contour lines around the oxygen than there are around the hydrogen. That's because if you look at the electronegativities, oxygen is... Um, 3.5 and hydrogen is 2.1, right? Where do I get those values? Oxygen here, 3.5, hydrogen 2.1. What's the difference between 3.5 and 2.1? 1.4. So where does that put it on that table? Polar covalent, right? So these are polar covalent bonds. And since the oxygen is more electronegative, the oxygen has pulled the electrons towards it, so the oxygen side of the molecule is negative and the hydrogen side of the molecule is positive. So oxygen is a dipole, water is a dipole, and that's why I could do that little trick. Okay. So do you agree that oxygen's electronegativity value is bigger than hydrogen? So that means oxygen pulls electrons towards it. So that's why the oxygen side of the molecule is negative, a little bit negative. And the hydrogen side is a little bit not positive because the hydrogen's all sort of lost its electrons. Yeah, I know, but they're both on the same side of the molecule. <laughs> but remember, you're looking at each bond. So in the molecule, there's two bonds. So on this bond here, if I went here and I went to um, let's get a pin, these two electrons that are being shared, where are they? They are here. They're not in the middle. And these two electrons, where are they? They are also close to the oxygen. 
So it's this bond. We really should do it like this, delta plus and delta minus, delta plus and delta minus. It's each bond is polar. So it's good questions. So what does being polar actually mean? I understand it's from the zero. Being polar zero. means it's got a slight positive bit and a slight negative bit. So what's the difference between like a non-polar? Is it just a non-polar there would be no positive and no negative because it's equally shared. Say that again. Okay, we're going to come to examples of that. We're going to come to examples of that. Because in this molecule, the positives, you can see the two positives of the hydrogen kind of like lay on the same side of the molecule here. So that's why this side is positive and this side is negative. And if they were directly opposite, there'd be no overall charge, even although there's polar bonds. And we will do examples of that. So let's go and have a look. What does it say? This is a polar bond. The oxygen atom has a bigger electronegativity than the chlorine atom. Therefore, you've got unequal sharing, and that creates a dipole. The water molecule is a dipole. It's charged, and you can demonstrate. And it hugely affects the chemistry of water. I don't know if you guys ever think much about water. Matt, you're going to sleep there, but... Oh, okay. I don't know if you guys ever think much about water. You, you're taking notes, eh? Yes. You're taking notes, okay. So I'm assuming you've written some of this down. Yeah. This here? Yeah. On the slide? Yeah. So if I looked at your page, I could see some of this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I know if you guys think much about water, right? But, you know, for example, let's, let's go and roam around the, the solar system a bit. You go to Mercury, you go to Venus, you go to other places. Are they nice places to be? No. Yeah. <laughs> the few that you could walk on, like Mercury and Venus, probably more like the Sahara did than anything else. Okay. Hot as hell or freezing cold, just dust and rocks. That's all. Not the nicest place to spend forever. When you come to Earth, what do you find? Yes, water, plants, flowers. It's lovely. Water. Jeez, this stuff's incredible. I mean, I'm a surfer. I love water. Okay. Um, hey? Like yeah. <laughs> Only what do we know of? It's a very interesting question. Okay. If you go and have a look at, you know, how many other suns are there in the universe? Bullet. So how many other potential planets are there in the universe? Bullet. So what's the chances that there's another planet somewhere in the universe that's got the conditions right for life? Tiny. Almost zero. People have done the calculation. Okay? There are so many factors that need to be just at a certain value, otherwise life couldn't exist on, the, on our planet, like our distance to the sun and all that kind of stuff. So the Goldilocks zone, you can the exist. Chance, sorry? In the Goldilocks zone, you can exist. <laughs> the chances of it happening, they reckon, are so small that there isn't time for it to happen by chance. There isn't even time for it to happen in the, the existing known lifespan of the universe. So it's fascinating. It's all speculation. Nobody really knows, but so that's some of the numbers people have done. Sorry? Organism adapts to those conditions. Sorry? Sorry? Adapts to those conditions. <laughs> well, they're talking about life as we know it. Oh. So. Yeah. Anyway, um, the properties of water, okay, just get back to where I... A little bit. The properties of water, all so many of them are determined by this polar nature. Okay? Water just wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for this incredible polar nature. It determines the chemistry of water almost entirely. And water's got some particular. Yeah. So I spoke to you about dipole moments. Now, what is a dipole moment again? It's showing you which direction the electrons have been pulled. I think you'll agree with me the electrons from this hydrogen have been pulled towards the oxygen. And the electrons from this hydrogen have been pulled towards that oxygen. Because of the shape of the, of the water molecule, and I'll talk more about the shape a little bit later, there's an overall dipole moment from the left to the right. That's why I draw the plus here and the minus there. There's an overall dipole moment. That turns out to be important. It's a resultant dipole moment. Did you do vectors last year? Remember resultant vectors? walk there, then I walk here, what's my resultant? Zero. Result. But if I walk there, then I walk there, then my resultant is there. This is the same. There's one pulling 
down this way. There's one pulling up this way. So the vertical and the and the um, or the two vertical components cancel out, but the sideways component doesn't. Question. So the hydrogen is being pulled to the center of the oxygen. Yeah. The, the hydrogen's electrons. Yeah. Can't we just take? <laughs> I wouldn't like you to. Do that. I wouldn't like you to do that. Um, I would say no. Yes. Did you have a question? Say again. You just need to speak up. Does that mean that the electronegativities are the same? Stays the same. Stays the same. Okay, good question. So, does, so do you mean you don't add up the electronegativities because there's two hydrogens? Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't, because you look at each bond. So the bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen. Yeah. Good question. So does that answer my question about that? Like four elements. Yes. And yes, because you're looking at each bond individually. Yes, but we'll come back to that. We're going to come back to shapes. All right, so dipole moment. If a moment, if a molecule has a charge separation, is it it's referred to as a dipole moment. Um, here I'm showing you how the dipole moments add up. So what I've done is I've taken those two vectors and I've drawn a vector diagram. And then I've shown that there's a result. And you actually must be able to do that. But you can see why vectors turn out to be so important. They're even used in chemistry. All right. Can I move off there? It's fairly straightforward. Well, look, here's a arrow pulling down. There's an arrow pulling up. Now, if you add those vectors, if you remember when you did vectors, uh, let's do that. When we did vectors, when you add vectors, you draw them tail to head. So I could take this vector and put it there. The tail of this vector is by the head of that one. Then the resultant would be there, which is exactly what I've done here on the right. Happy? Okay. <laughs> Right, so here's a little task for you. What I want you to do in here is I want you to show the dipole moments. Um, well, firstly, some of the polarities that I've shown there are incorrect. So have a look at those diagrams. Stanley, you need to wake up with something. <laughs> Um, have a look at those diagrams and have a look at the electronegativity values and see if you can figure out if which of those <laughs> polarities on the molecules I've shown, are they correct or are they wrong? There wouldn't be one. Yeah. Hmm. It's not a good time. You've only got, what, 10, 11 minutes? Can you survive? Okay. Sorry? Why? No. You won't you won't dive first in the next eleven minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I've drawn them there just because they are there. I, I didn't have to. Um I'm just showing the lone pairs, but you don't, you shouldn't really show the lone pairs in a Cooper diagram. So they shouldn't actually be there. Yes. You can blow your nose, yes. Sorry, there's tissues, there's a big roll of tissue. Yeah. So it's, it's above the two, how do you draw the dolphin? That's I know. Say that again. No, so then, then it's ionic. Uh, we'll get there. Then you show full positive or full negative. Right, so let's have a look. Are any of those polarities wrong? Which one? The far right one. So you're saying that the chlorine should be negative and the boron should be positive. I agree. 
Oi, Cameron. You don't get another demon talking while I'm trying to teach. Because boron has an electronegativity of two and chlorine has an electronegativity of three. So chlorine will be more negative than boron. And I've drawn it the wrong way out. Yeah. So I've drawn it like that on purpose just to get you thinking. Um, no? You seem to be in the center of too much there. Okay. So have a look. This one, I did it intentionally. I think I'm making up. They have done it right. Okay. So please fix it. Delta plus, delta minus. That's wrong. The chlorines are more electronegative. It should be delta minus on the chlorines and delta plus on the boron. Okay. But you're looking at each bond. Looking at each bond. Now, what I've said here is show the dipole moments as well. So I actually want you to show the dipole moments on those bonds. So here I've drawn a dipole moment on this one bond here. I want you to draw a dipole moment on every single bond. Please. Draw a dipole moment, an arrow thing like this with a cross on the other end. Put the cross on the positive side. Draw one of those correctly on every single bond. Well, if the outside negative, like the chlorine, then which way does the arrow go? Exactly. Well, they've got a point to where it's negative, so there'll be one from here going there, and one from here going there, because it's for each bond. Yes, Mo, what's your question? H2O? Yes? Well, each bond. So you're going to have one on this bond and one on this bond. But you go, they've always got to point towards the negative. You draw them all quickly, then I'll we'll check them. Draw them in, in pencil in case you make a mistake. Does that have a cost a bit in drama? No. Yeah, so just do it towards the, the drawn arrow towards the negatives on all of them, and then we'll check. Now, what I've done, here's I've done the water one. I've drawn the individual ones, and then I've added them up to an overall resultant. Okay. Now, I want you to do that on each of them. For the individual ones, you've done that already. Now, show the resultant dipole mo moment of the whole molecule. So, how do you have the, how do you have the three molecules? Yeah. Well, you've got to figure it out. Remember, you're adding vectors. You're adding vectors. <laughs> it's one, yeah, so it's that red one. So, for example, the HCL, there's only one. So that is the result. Yeah, so well, the one I showed you was actually the result. Yeah. Yeah. How do you know which way the precession goes? You could add the vectors. So look, if you've got one this one going this way, one going this way, one going up, those three add up to Yeah? I mean you know this so if you're doing if you're doing vectors, you'd be you'd be doing something like this. Come on. You'd be basically going, if you're doing this one, you'd say, all right, I've got one vector going there, I've got one vector going there, and I've got one vector going here. Well, how do you add vectors? You put them tail to head. So you'd say one there, one there, and one here. 
tail's head, tail's head. What's if I, if I walk there and there and there, what's my result? Yeah, all the way to there. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the question. There might not always be a resultant. Because vectors can cancel out. So if I go here, H to S, those two add up to the horizontal one, same as water. But if we now do this one, we've got one pulling out, one pulling out, and one pulling out. So what happens? No overall dipole moment. So, Annie, I have to be 